and welcome to Can I Just Say? From Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. And this week, we are, again, I feel like this is my trend now, we are again doing a film that I loved once upon a time, hadn't seen in a while, Mm -hmm. terrified to watch it again, and love it still. As you should be. (laughs) That's so good. (laughs) It's on Netflix now, which is excellent. Means anybody can watch it. Yes, absolutely go watch it. Um... Yeah, this is a great film. I like It's Bull Durham, which we haven't said yet. Oh, right. So we should Sorry. say that. Bull Durham is the name of the film, y'all. Kevin Costner, Susan Sarandon, Tim Robbins. Right, Tim Robbins. This is actually mm-hmm. when Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins met. Fascinating. I know. Isn't it weird? Because It's weird. Because she has all the chemistry in the world with Kevin Costner and, and none. none. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not with Tim Robbins, nor should she, because that character is deplorable. Exactly. But still, uh, that's fascinating. I know. It's yeah. just kind of a fun, it's a fun meta like aspect to watching this movie is knowing that, yes. that these two met, fell in love, and got married because of this movie. So funny. Yes. Um, so yes, it is by Ron Shelton, who I don't, I'm not crazy about his other movies, but I am crazy about this one. I love this so much that I looked him up and was like, I don't know any of this stuff. I don't know. What uh, these things, well, Tin Cup what these actually was another him and Kevin Costner doing sports together. Tin Cup, I've heard of. It's not also, great. is it Renee Russo yep. in that one? Who is I love wow. her. I know. I, maybe it's fine. I just remember after this, like, because I knew that was this. Sure. When I saw that, I knew that that was this. You know, the two so of then them. Then you're like primed. You right. want something amazing. Exactly. Sure. So my expectations were likely too high. He also did White Men Can't Jump, which is is a great movie. I remember really enjoying it. Oh, I don't know how okay. I feel about that one now either, but I remember liking it. Okay, um, fair enough. That's not what I've seen, for sure. Uh, but yeah, but nothing... I mean, this... For me, this movie is, like, on par with Moonstruck, I've got to say. Like, I just think it is beautiful. It's quirky. It's... Yes. Just really well balanced like it's just a movie that you watch it and you're just like yeah you're never bored you're always enjoying yourself it's always doing things that are interesting Mm -hmm. um it just poignant and a little bit mythical but somehow not pretentious at all right right right. yeah hilarious hilariously so because one of its characters is so pretentious and i love her for it So it's actually fair enough, and that's the other thing is like it manages to mock its character while absolutely adoring them at the same time. Yes, I do think that's true. Yeah, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it, it's it never feels vicious. Very, it's never vicious and it's never snarky. That's no. right. It's just kind of quirky. I think is the word. Just kind of like it's lovingly ribbing its right, characters right. a it's, little bit. Yeah, it's challenging right. them. I mean, because that's how they grow. Them. Um, yes. and, but it's not right, but always lovingly so. And they are kind of absurd sometimes. And I, yes, but you love them for and it. wrong often. Yep. Yeah. Which I really like. Yep. There's nobody who is in, in any way perfect. Like everybody's nope. got at least one scene. We're like, Ooh, bad call. Right. Bad call though. <laughs> well, and like Moonstruck, it's like you have flawed characters that make so much more sense when their flaws mesh with each other and they learn from each other. Yes. And I really mm-hmm. enjoy, I just, again, I, I ended up with the same feeling as with Moonstruck. It's just like, why I feel like people aren't doing romance this way right now. They are not, Daphne. They are not. And it makes my heart sad. Right? Because these are beautiful films and there's a space for it now i think like on netflix and even well mostly netflix but people can just do their little indie movies but they're not going through hollywood in the same way that they were nothing's in the movie theaters like they were but it seems like it's either really crappy i say that i shouldn't say crappy really hokey right. we'll say it that way like the hallmark movies right or really slice of life kind of there's no magic you know what i mean like right i yeah there's something sad and a little grim and romantic but in a bittersweet sort of mm. way which you know i, I love that like, as well but no sure like there's i i have room for right. that too but these kinds of like almost magical romance right. these kinds of just like but not but not magical in a way where it doesn't stick you know what i mean no. like like they oh, absolutely yeah. feel they feel real. They don't necessarily, I mean, although 
these people do feel like people I would know. I mean, Moonstruck, not necessarily. They're a little, they're more Moonstruck's a little more mythic. Yeah, they're more mm-hmm. heightened. They're more. Um, I think what's missing for me in romance now is, and I don't consider these romantic comedies. Like that's a different thing. And I enjoy romantic comedies. Like that's a mm-hmm. different, um, is that the romance is built on connection and, and interpersonal, like, like what I said, like that they're flawed, but their flaws together make them learn. Like, mm-hmm. I don't feel like I see a lot of romance now where it's rooted in that. Um, I feel like a lot of times it's rooted more in what the viewer wants to see. Do you understand? Like, like, I feel like a lot of times... Can you give me an example? Oh, I hate... See, I'm going to give you an example of a movie I really love that I think you didn't see, but I don't feel like it's... Um, I feel... <laughs> <laughs> I feel kind of bad saying this because I do love this and a lot of people love it um, is um, Call Me By Your Name, which oh, is... Oh, I saw most of it, but that's another one okay. that's it's that same kind of like slice of life and just a little bit more on the... Uh, I don't know how you... It's not grim. Grim is no, right. No. It's that realist, it's... I suppose. I don't know if I would say that with that one either. It's very dreamy in my eyes and I love it. I mean, I have to like say what I'm about to say, say I did. loved yeah. the film. Mm-hmm. I feel like, um, to some extent for me, the, what I, I mean, I enjoyed like the atmosphere and the pacing and everything about the film and the father's last speech, which you should continue watching it. Cause you have oh, to get, just so I hear that. To okay. To that All right. Oh my God. It's amazing. I can do that. Literally. There were like 20 minutes left. It's midnight. I'm like, I can't go back, I go, go to back bed. and watch the rest of it. It's amazing. Okay. Um, I no, will. and the actors are incredible, but I feel like what was drawing me into that is wanting to be part of it. Like their attraction to each other was very satisfying to me, but it, okay. but it didn't feel like it was based in, in character in the way that Completely. this is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think- no, I feel a lot of times we have people who kind of collide. This is what I see. Like, right. like life brings these two people together and you watch them fall in love and you're like, okay, great. But that's not the same as these movies like like moonstruck and um and here like bull durham where yeah where you see them kind of like sparkle together right I guess. Well, like, they're like, like puzzle you pieces. see this kinetic energy yeah well, they're like yeah. puzzle pieces and you understand how one of them like that they were each fine by themselves and that something about the way that they interact makes you realize how each of them is challenging the other one and yes. helping and them enhancing right. the other and becomes a symbiotic thing right. that just is really satisfying. Right. Yeah, exactly. So whereas in call me by your name, I loved both of them and I loved being them to get them to be together. And I was rooting for them and I was so happy in the part that you haven't seen yet and, and stuff like that. But I never, I didn't feel like I got to know either of them in a way where I understood how, how they fit to each other. Like I understood they were, yeah. I understood that they thought they fit, but it didn't, sure. I didn't feel that fitting. And I feel like that's a lot of what's going on is like, I definitely will watch romances where I'm rooting for them and I'm like into it and I'm certainly enjoying watching it, but I couldn't go through and analyze why they are perfect for each other. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and this totally works that way. So it just for me, I mean, that's just, you know, you know who I am. It's just like, for me, I, you know, I almost need to analyze characters like they're real people. And so sure. for me, it's always going to be more satisfying if I, if I can see, like, kind of crack them open and understand them yeah. on that level. Well, is that how you want to go through this episode then? You want to do little character breakdowns? Uh, did you have a thought about I did. how you wanted to start talking about it? Well, I'm very tempted to just read Annie's first speech. <laughs> Annie's first speech was written for me. <laughs> However many years ago, someone was like, one day, Elizabeth's going to need to hear this. So I'm just going to go ahead and jot this down. Uh, well, I did jot it down. I actually found the script online. Of course you I did. found No, I found the script online because oh, wow. I just was like, I just need I just need to be able to have at my fingertips certain parts of this script for the rest of my life. Uh, so would you like me to read it to you? I would. I mean, your I accent would. is well, your accent it's... is more appropriate for the lines <laughs> than mine. But um, <laughs> yeah, I just think this might be the best, one of my favorite ever character introductions. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I agree. Okay, nope, it's it's beautiful. Okay, I believe in the Church of Baseball, 
I've tried all the major religions and most of the minor ones. I've worshipped Buddha, Allah, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, trees, mushrooms, and Isadora Duncan. I know things. For instance, there are 108 beads in a Catholic rosary, and there are 108 stitches in a baseball. When I learned that, I gave Jesus a chance. (laughs) But it just didn't work out between us. The Lord laid too much guilt on me. I prefer metaphysics to theology. You see, there's no guilt in baseball, and it's never boring, which makes it like sex. There's never been a ball player slept with me who didn't have the best year of his career. Making love is like hitting a baseball. You just got to relax and concentrate. (laughs) I have to disagree. I think that baseball is sometimes boring, but... Beyond that, it's a perfect little Okay, speech. this might be the point where I confess that every single thing I know about baseball is from this is movie. From this movie. <laughs> <laughs> what about a league of their own? <laughs> I remember that there's no crying in baseball. That's honestly there's all no I remember from the movie. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> That's and it. also, as you learn in both films, don't mess with the umpires. They will throw you out. Right. Okay, I did know that. I did know that. I have been to a baseball game, but I barely remember it. Uh, oh, yes, I am a bad, bad American. Yeah, and that's why I'm always amused because I feel like a lot of times when I'm convincing people to watch this movie, it's kind of like me with Pirates. It's like, I never cared about baseball, but I sure. care about this story a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I feel that baseball is at its best, like the smaller the stakes are like your kid's baseball game is more fun than um than the well, world God, series than, yes than the world See, series I know, it's, exactly. I know it's called the world series. Gonna say, the world series there you go but also just like you know some kind of neighborhood game or whatever is still i think more fun and more exciting to watch than minors like the mm-hmm. minors are not fun for me see it's, i watch this movie and then i'm always ty- i'm always tempted to go to a minor league game afterwards sure yeah <laughs> yep we've got one right here in the city all the time there are fireworks outside yeah, my window we, all the time we've got one near us too i yeah. should maybe I someday know. i don't know it's practically um, free to go so i did i do want to do characters but i would like to start with just the love of baseball like that and that kind of ties into well i don't want sure. to talk about it at the end but i find it fascinating when i'm like try- thinking about this film like it really is a beautiful homage to baseball and even someone like me who doesn't care about baseball really can visit a world where where that is beautiful does that make mm-hmm. sense yeah yeah you do need the tom hanks speech though from uh league of their own which is it's supposed to be hard if it wasn't hard everyone would do it the hard is what makes it great okay that actually fits quite well. So that in, right? really fits very well with this whole idea of like, and the thing I love that this movie explores that those films usually don't is this idea of like something akin to creativity in baseball where you just get into a slump and it's like, it's, it should be a physical muscle memory thing. Like you're good at it or not. You're a fast runner or you're a slow runner. Like you can, but it's not like that with baseball and with a lot of other sports. Like you have... Some, there is something almost metaphysical exactly. about it. Like there's something that's in your head. I love everything that the movie has to say about that, this idea of slumps and luck. And do they give it a word in the, in the movie? Like all of these different kind of superstitions and no, I don't think, lucky penny rabbit's foot type things? I don't think they specifically talk about that. I mean, I think, I mean, this is also something that even someone like me knows they about don't. baseball is that it is, there are a lot of rituals about it and a lot of superstition related to it and stuff like that. So I think that's something I know. Wait, I do want to, um, I wanted to bring up my friend Clint, who is a friend I know through Game of Thrones stuff. Awesome. Um, Howdy, Clint. Who, uh, yes, Clint and I have a hilarious uh, crossover taste in movies from the 80s, it turns out. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Which is... Everyone needs that friend. uh, Okay. (laughs) I said everyone needs that friend. Uh, yeah, okay. it, it's it's really fun to have that friend. And wait, I'm looking for, he gave me a lot of memory. And he is a baseball person, like baseball family, oh. baseball person. 
Interesting. So I wanted to quote him real quickly with his permission. He said that one of the things he loves about this movie as opposed to other baseball movies or sports movies in general, he said, is that it's not about winning a game or a championship or anything. It's about playing the game. Hmm. And that's why this is his favorite, right? It's about the love of the game. And I love in the beginning when Crash first shows up and he's, you know, he's pissed off about the rule that they're giving him. And he's like, why would I do this? And they're like, yeah, because you get to play the game another year. Yeah. And I really love that. I love, I mean, I think this is like something me as a craftsperson can really relate to, like this just love of the doing. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that, about if there, if, if there was a relation, because I did see it as such a creative thing of this idea of like being in a slump and also just, just wanting to do it and kind of having to do it. That kind of like compulsion mm-hmm, that we see mm-hmm. with Crash, especially, I think that even him and Annie going to the batting cages, like this is your job, man. And you're going on a date to the batting cages. Well, it wasn't actually a date. That was her giving him tips, no. but you know, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> although he did proposition her. <laughs> Felt like a date to me. That's what I'm saying. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> yeah, what's a date with Annie is very complex. <laughs> That's true. That's, That's true. like, could be a whole Here. podcast episode in itself. <laughs> Um, but yeah, there's just an aspect of that that is fascinating. Like it is a career, it is a practice almost. I mean, again, this, this combination with religion is like, you know, you can laugh about it, but it makes a lot, it, like it really works. It's really sure. fascinating to me. Um, it's a practice, it's a vocation, it's a passion. It's all the of these things at one good. time. Mm-hmm. And, and Did it you is, ever play team sports? What? Did you ever play team sports? Oh, no, not remotely. I, the not only things all. I ever did was swim and ski, and I swam not competitively. And no, nothing. Daphne, I have to say that's too bad. There is a magical quality. Huh. That's really interesting. Yeah, I did not grow up wow. with that at all. Okay. I played softball for like six, seven years, something like that, from, you know, T-ball to mm-hmm. like when I was 13 or something. And I was on like a really good team in the league. We're always first or second place. And I was weirdly, I say weirdly, not weirdly like surprisingly and supernaturally, but weirdly for me, because you wouldn't think this, but I was actually good at it too (laughs) when I was a kid, which I feel like does not fit. (laughs) But I was like a pitcher and like a shortstop and like the good roles, like the ones you're like, oh no, cool. I was not a left fielder or anything, you know? So, and it's, it's a, there's a little bit of magic mm-hmm. there and there is those nights where it's just like similar to theater mm-hmm. or something like it's I love that they called it the show yes go into the show like that really spoke to me because it is it's like there's an element of I mean obviously it's like a performance sport but there's an element of like that's entertainment you know what right. I mean of of the American and the ball game and like when the crowd is down and it affects the players and they're not doing as well and this idea that somebody hits a home run and everybody just jumps out of their seats and the energy is electric. It's pretty cool. That's neat. Yeah, it's a neat thing. I can definitely see where she was like, baseball's my religion. I was like, I get that. That's a worship service. Right. Totally. Right. Absolutely. Like hands in the air, everybody hollering together. I get it. Well, and I mean, okay, I'm going to show my hand. Oh, God, there's so many, there's so many ways. So many hands to show. There's so many hands to show. I mean, there's so many ways. <laughs> That I love Annie. There's so many ways that I identify Mm. with her and don't identify with her. There's, I mean, the first time I saw this movie, I was 20. So like how I identify with her has morphed. Sure. It's fascinating. Um, Yes, I do. I'm going to bring up a line from the end, which I think is just hilarious. Like I just started laughing in my living room when I heard this at near the end when she wants to start talking to him about stuff, like when he comes back to her. And he tells her that, you know. When on the porch? Yeah. The last in the scene. Rain? Right. Oh, yeah. In the rain. Oh, God, that's a <laughs> and she starts like. Anything in the rain. I'm just doing, like, I'm in love. She starts doing I'm her yammering, yammering, yammering. And he says, I've got a long time to hear your theories. And I want to hear every damn one of them. And I was like, oh, my God. She is me. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's listened to our podcasts in any, sure. any iteration, any form knows that, you know, I am a girl with a bunch of theories. My theories are different than hers, different mm-hmm. source material. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Although, 
<laughs> but sure, that's true love right there. And I was just like, like, oh my God, she's like, she, she is like, she is like me. That's like someone who truly loves me will like sit there and listen to my just sit and listen, <laughs> pour you another scotch. Right. Tell me more. Yeah, Liz, how many, how many hours now have you clocked of listening to my wacky theories? <laughs> many, many, many. <laughs> I don't know exactly. But I just, I love that it's all integrated, like, because it is, it's a, it's about enthusiasm. I mean, that's the thing that mm-hmm. she and Crash have in common is that the enthusiasm, like the love of the game, you mean? Or the, the love of, I mean, it, in this case, it does happen to be in the game of the game, sure. but for, in her case, it's also a love of literature and a love of music and a love of her own yes, sense of yes. herself as a romantic and yes. <laughs> Like, it's true. They are people who like the the word we have for it at our house is like drink deep, like just enjoy as much as you can and get to the heart of everything you can get to the heart of. And yeah, just just jump all the way into the things that you are really into and, and that spark something in you for whatever reason. Oh, my God. Her like Walt Whitman Bible was amazing. <laughs> right. That was incredible. I sing of the body electric. Yep. I was like, yes. And then Crash's speech for that same scene right before that, I yep. think. I'll tell you what I believe in. Yep. Holy smokes. That's a hell of a speech. And I'll tell you something. I heard that speech out of context at some point oh my in goodness. my life. Okay, that's a weird I that's how. a weird speech out of it context. It was fucking weird out of context. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I was like he sound- Wet kisses for three days right. is gross. It what sounds- are you talking about? No, it about? sounds horrible even- out of context, I'm horrible. sure. Yeah. Uh, right. But in context, it works beautifully. Oh, Crash, you do make speeches. Right. And, and I love it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many times, but I just love when her only reaction to him is, oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, God. Yeah, no, for sure. Oh, it's so cute. But Crash is like, he's my favorite one because, you know, I do. I can relate very much to Annie and her theorizing and like how she goes on these crazy tangents. Sure. Um, but Crash is fascinating to me because he has all of that passion and he knows his limitations. And so mm-hmm. his passion is combined with such, um, I don't know. I don't I don't think integrity is the right word. The he. Humility, maybe. Yeah, well, but humility. But it, what what I'm getting at is like how how meticulous he is, like how much his passion is combined with his practice of of um, uh, of good practice. Um, that's not, that's that's bad English, but but he's, <laughs> that he um, he takes so seriously doing things well. Okay, sure. And I really appreciate that about him, like that he knows he's not the guy with the million dollar arm. Yeah. I was thinking of that scene on the bus right? where he takes the guitar away. It's like, it's not wooly. Women don't get wooly. They get weary. I hate when people mess up the lyrics. Like that's a very crash moment. Well, but he's that way with himself as well. You know, so you get oh to my see God. both Can of them. Can we talk about his inner right. dialogue? Right. We get to see both of them on the mound, like when they're both, at, well, we get to see we get to see um, uh, Ebby on the, I can't call him Nuke. We get to see Ebby on the mound. Ebby Nuke. Right. Can we meet? Right. That's my favorite. And, right. And we get to see Crash <laughs> when he's a bat. And and you get to see mm-hmm. both of them. There are moments where you get to hear both of them talking to themselves in their mind. Yeah. And Crash is so good at the practice of it. I mean, it's really, it is, again, it's almost like a meditation for him. He's just like, he's like, he knows oh, how to do well. He's like, get out of my head he's telling himself get out of your head like shake it off he just exactly the same things he tells ebby all the time he tells right. himself like we get yes. this snippet of moment where we understand that all of those things that he's teaching him he has already and he's taught just himself. as hard on himself as he is on ebby which i think makes him more sympathetic probably more harder so, right definitely harder actually yeah yes. i mean he's yeah, his inner monologue was sad I thought. Oh, that's interesting. I found. Yeah. I did not find it sad. Um, I find his. I mean, again, there are sad aspects to his life because he's a person who has a lot of talent, obviously, but not enough. Like he doesn't cross the bar into, you know, the full on crazy talent. And he right. chooses to make up for that with hard work and diligence. Mm-hmm. I don't find that sad. I find that. 
I find that I wish I had, I had written down. I thought I just checked my notes because I thought that maybe I had written down some of it. But it, it, to me, it was like almost the tone of voice that he used to talk to himself just bummed me out. Like he oh, seemed really hard on himself in a way. Like I felt he wasn't. He is. But I don't know. For me, I don't have a problem with that because a lot of people succeed because they, again, not hard on himself. I don't, I don't think he ever. I mean, okay, again, he is a drunk. We like see all these other sadder moments for him, but sure. but when he's when he's actually playing baseball, I don't feel like that. I feel like he is. I'll have to. He's go back being and watch rigorous, that again. certainly. But he's not. He's not being. Um, he's not rejecting himself. He's just having a rigorous practice of making sure he's doing things the correct way with it, which again aligns with sports. I mean, it's like doing, you know, any kind of exercise or doing dance. Like there is mm-hmm. a correct way to do these things. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't get point. to just like flail around and do whatever. Like there right. is a way to get yourself in the right place to do these things. And for him, I mean, again, for me, it really reminded me of meditation. It's like, get yourself out of your head, get yourself, mm-hmm. you know, get yourself, stop. He's telling himself to to not doubt himself, actually. He's saying, stop yeah, no, thinking. Yeah, that's true. Huh. Yeah, that's true. So that's what, I mean, again, if it makes you sad, I'm sorry, because it, does, it doesn't make me sad. But I'm just trying to, I guess, I think, trying to well, show you a different way to look at it. I think the thing that I'm it. comparing it to is, did you see Spider-Man Homecoming? Yes. Okay. You know when Spider-Man Peter Parker is under all the rubble? Mm-hmm. And he's trying to lift himself up. But he's like, come on, Spider-Man. Come on. Sp-. Like, right. that's my kind of inner monologue. I'm like, yes, you go. That's making my heart, you know, have warm, fuzzy feelings, right. I guess. But when someone's like, come on, come on. You know how to do this. Get out of your head or whatever. I'm just like, okay, all right. Just just be easy on yourself, maybe. Like, So I suppose that's all I meant to say. Yeah. No, I get that. But at the same time, like, remember with, with Nuke. I mean, I'll with- put it this way. If he was a dad talking to his son, like from the dugout, we'd say that guy's an asshole. That's true. But he's a professional. But he is a grown man. Right. He's a grown man and he's a professional athlete. Yeah. So he, and again, I think there's a beauty in it because he's, when, when we see Ebby think too much, he messes himself up. That is true. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, I I see it almost like a meditation. Like if you can choose, if you can convince yourself not to overthink something, you're actually taking away the, the, the space where you're being self-critical. Sure. So that makes sense. That's another way to look at it is you're actually taking away all of the self-doubt and just doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part where I see, um, I can I can quote Clint again if you would like. Clint gave <laughs> <laughs> sure sure. Clint had another really fascinating bit. Clint was talking about the um, their styles, the two actors of okay. of Kevin Costner and Tim Robbins, and he'd said that it's very obvious that Kevin Costner um, is actually a baseball player, and that um, that's right. He did Field of Dreams too. Right. Um, Got some baseball movies up his sleeve. And uh, and that Tim Robbins not, but he said, let's see. Uh, he had some notes. He he gave. I was like, okay, tell me stuff. And he's like, okay, here's some notes. Um, Nuke's wind up where he looks behind him before he throws to the plate is one insane, and B <laughs> intended to reference ex Dodgers pitcher Fernando Fernando Valenzuela who was a phenom in the early 80s and did something somewhat similar. Oh. But the point is that as a pitcher, you should never look away from your target as the mm-hmm. as part of the your wind-up since, you know, the point of pitching is to throw it at the target. Sure. Now I'm just reading his thing because I can't paraphrase. Um, <laughs> Annie suggests this thing that no pitching coach would suggest deliberately as a way to confuse him and get him to stop thinking so much. And it sort of works. She's absolutely right that most baseball players have to sit in this zone of relaxed concentration in order to have success. So that's how I, like I that. see what what Crash is doing, is he's talking mm-hmm. himself into that space. So like he and Annie both use all these techniques to make 
to make Ebby be in that space, like with the garter right. and breathing through the you eyelids, know. and right. the garter it was fun. Yeah, um, I like that. And you know, and Crash forcing him to listen to him. I mean, I mm-hmm. I love when he tells. I love when he tells the batters the the pitch that's about to come, just to like fuck him. Oh, up. exactly. <laughs> yes, I just I love everything about his cranky self. Mm-hmm. He, he does have some beautiful crankiness. Definitely. Um, so yeah, it's a great character, and this is prime Kevin Costner too. Like a lot of times, I don't get the Kevin Costner thing, but I get it in this movie. Right. This, as long as he's not just delivering dialogue, right. at which he is very, very bad, folks. He is very bad, <laughs> but he has a presence. Right. Right. I mean, I think he really inhabits this character in a way that is just beautiful. Mm. Really, really beautiful. I think it. It has really interesting things to say about um, having a calling. Like, I think that that mm. Evie is talented, and that's why he ended up there. But for Crash, it's a calling. And that's a hmm. different relationship to it. Yeah. I really wanted to bring up the cliches that, oh, yeah. that Crash teaches Evie in the bus. Mm-hmm. And I had always kind of overlooked the cliche. I was like, oh, okay, he's teaching him a thing he needs to learn. And then we hear him repeat them. And then I realized that the cliches actually sum up Crash's relationship, possibly to baseball, but certainly to that year and that and that team. Oh, sure. Should I read them real quickly? Like, I'm just happy to be in the game. Yep, or... yep. Yeah. Here, he says, uh, we've got to play them one day at a time. Mm-hmm. Which, again, goes back to this thing we were just talking about, that you just have to be in the moment. You just have to be in the headspace of yeah, what in you're the doing. Yeah, in the zone, right. as it were. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just happy to be here. Hope I can help the ball club, which goes to the what, ball club, which okay. what he said in the beginning where they said to him where he wanted to quit. And they were like, but you get to play another year if you do yeah. this. And it was just like, wow, these like these cliches. I don't know if it's sad or like or like somehow twisting it around and being like the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, philosophic. I mean, the last one is I just want to give it my best shot and the good Lord willing things will work out. Yeah. And it's just like all of that really kind of sums up the place that Crash is, which, again, could be sad. Or it's bittersweet, I think. Yeah, it is. But there's there's a there is a beauty in there. And this, I guess, is like mm-hmm. comes to like my personal philosophy is like I am my happiest when I like wake up in the morning and do things well all day. Sure. And I'm happy with the day I had. Mm hmm. Where you just, you focus on the thing in front of you and you do that thing yep. well and you end your day having done things well. Yeah, absolutely. And there is like, there's a real beauty in that. And again, that's not the guy with the million dollar arm who like can't keep his flip flops clean but has a Porsche. Right. <laughs> right. right? Like that's uh-huh. a different person mm-hmm. with different goals and different values, but there is a beauty in being the person who just does things well without the fanfare. Yeah, definitely. And through that kind of like methodology, that mm-hmm. meticulousness mm-hmm. that you talked about. Yeah. Okay. Now let's get to Annie and Crash because that's where all that stuff goes out the window. <laughs> Because she just I adore them shakes, together very much. She shakes his shit up, and he shakes hers up. <laughs> yeah. Let's. See, where do you want to start with them? I would like to start with Annie. The end of Annie, or somewhere in the middle of Annie's speech, after the part I read, where she's talking about the baseball players that she chooses and has sex with for one season, and she says, mm-hmm. "I make them feel confident, and they make me feel safe and pretty." Hmm. Yep. And then she says, what I give them lasts their whole life. And what they give me lasts 148 or 43 games, however many it is in the season. I don't know. I'm sorry, Clint. Some number, (laughs) some normal, some number of games, days, months, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what's interesting that they have in common is that each of them have um, created a world for themselves that makes sense to them in a lot of ways until it's questioned by the other one Mm -hmm. and the other one 
scares them. Like they both have moments where one of them accuses the other of being afraid. Yes. And they both are afraid. And they both are afraid because they both mm -hmm. have like really compartmentalized things in a way mm -hmm. that like may not be the best deal. Like just like she said, it may not be a great trade. It's not the best deal, but it's the deal that they've kind of created for themselves that makes sense to them. Yeah. And for him, it's his meticulousness. And for her, it's her like <laughs> layers on layers and layers of ritual that she's created. Yes, yes. <laughs> her quirky spirituality and metaphysical, right. whatever it is. And the meaning yeah. that she has imbued in all of that mm -hmm. for herself, Absolutely. which again, also admirable. Like that's just as admirable for me as his meticulous way of doing things well. Her mm -hmm. ability to like create meaning for herself and fill I her love world. the shrine in her house. Yeah. So cool. With just a little bit of everything in there and all the candles. That was really nice set design. That was very cool. Well, and just, and she has this beautiful, you know, she has this beautiful uh, tendency to adorn the world around her in a way that makes her feel the way she wants to feel. Like it's something mm -hmm. that she does for herself. Yeah, it's in her costuming choices yep. so much. Exactly. Which are very... I wonder about that. And you can probably tell me about this because, like, of course, it's got that really, like, classic 50s mm -hmm. vibe. But were there other people dressing that way? In the 80s. In that Absolutely. time? Absolutely. Yes. yes. The 50s okay. were very right. in thought... fashion in the 80s. I mean... Awesome. Again, what she was doing was very also quirky, which is appropriate for her character. Like, it's it yes. was not... Mm -hmm. But yes, the 50s were very much in fashion in the 80s. Awesome. Uh, also, shout out to Clint our other movie that we totally have in common is Grease 2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which was like the wow. height of Going worship. back to school. Worship, worship of the 50s in, oh, yeah. in the 80s. Yes. Sure. Yeah. The like. The band, the Stray Cats. The, there was just a lot yeah, of. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> The little neckerchiefs yep. and oh yeah okay all right I see that um, but at the same time Annie is doing it in a way that's very Annie and she also isn't mm -hmm. just fifty she's also like her robes and stuff are very forties like she's she's yep she's oh I love she's all the playing the with a lot the of robes. Robes. she's playing yeah. with a lot of time frames and I think what you do mm -hmm. get out of it is just that Annie is Annie and Annie is sculpting yep. her in physical environment in a way that feels meaningful to Annie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Her house is so quirky and huge. <laughs> Every time we get an exterior <laughs> house, I'm like, what are you doing? Why don't you have an apartment? Who cleans that? Well, <laughs> she does. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. Until she kind finds of? a joint on the floor <laughs> that she starts smoking in. This is what I'm saying. Those upstairs rooms are not habitable. I love her. I love her so much. You know, she's just very busy putting like scarves and perfume on the lamp bulbs. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> she's got a whole thing going on downstairs. Upstairs is haunted. It's fine. Oh, I love her so much. <laughs> so yeah, the scene the scene that kind of like expressed the beautiful way that each of them pokes in like they have actually mirrored scenes of like I feel like are are the physical manifestations of the way that they poke into each other's safety zones mm -hmm. is that um when Ebby won't have sex with Annie you know because baseball rituals don't mess with the street right. that's right mm -hmm. um and then she that's a great fight that those two have crashing in yes then. so I love yeah. that when she comes okay he, I, I totally tweeted about this he is ironing his shirts with a glass of scotch and i just was like that's it this is crash right here there's, there's my guy right. he just oh my god let's get married <laughs> right. he loves yep. his good scotch and he is going to iron his shirts and i was like that is crash right there that's yep. like everything mm -hmm. we need to know about him in one moment and she comes in and they have the wonderful fight where she where he's she's like william blake and he's like william blake and she's like <laughs> william blake <laughs> Yes. I just love that. <laughs> it is a great fight, but he fights dirty, I think, in that one right at first, at least. I also don't like – what do you think of, of, of this? Because it seemed to me 
when he com- he's complaining about Nuke or Ebby mm-hmm. or whatever, you, and about you how him you've him got I keep almost yeah, calling him whatever. Nuke. I just like but Ebby better. You've got him parading around the locker room like a fruit. He says, which is like a very uncool thing to say. It is first an uncool of all. thing to say. But then when he is talking to Ebby about it, there is zero judgment there. <laughs> no. None. None. And scenes later, he's in a kimono, dancing, painting her toenails. It's like, you're just giving her shit right he's now. Just he's giving, just pissed off. He's just it's giving not, her shit. Anyway, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Also, did you notice his face when she's like, she's like, okay, let's go to my house. And then, and Ebby's like, which one of us? And she's like, well, both of you, of course. And Crash yes. just gives him this look like, cool. <laughs> like, All right. Like, this is where I'm we down. are. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think Crash... he also opens up that one as an asshole. There's a little bit of like the two of them, you know, doing the whole, I don't know what you call that, uh, like button heads, I guess. Yeah. But I was thinking like the antlers is what's the, there's, there's an ism about that when dudes are duding really hard about a chick and that's what it was. And then she and ends I didn't up, like and that. she ends up dancing with the clown. No, see, I like, just like, you know what? I liked it yeah. because they got and their then, comeuppance about it. So I was okay with it. I was totally okay That's with it. I think that this show does that kind of thing really beautifully yeah. where it's like, here's some gross toxic masculinity that totally just fizzles out into nothing and doesn't work right. because this stuff is garbage in a way that was almost dismissive and quite lovely. Yeah. Oh no, definitely dismissive of that. Like that's stupid. Yeah. Whenever they do that, they just are being stupid. Whenever they do that, they're being stupid. Right. Exactly. And here's a couple of guys being idiots. Exactly. Like, yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, precisely. the movie's very clear that they're being stupid. Yeah, I really Again, liked that. Like with all the characters, the movie's also very clear that Annie's being absurd whenever she like way too much quotes authors where she's like, I'm going to quote an author, author, therefore you have to just accept my argument because... Yeah, therefore I'm right. Because William Blake. <laughs> yes, because William Blake. Okay. Yeah. And I love that he calls her on that where he's just like, mm-hmm. he's just like, yeah, I also read books. You can't yeah. pull this shit on me because yeah. I'm not one of your little boys. And I love how we had that Hispanic player who was concerned about his cursed bat mm-hmm. and needed the chicken foot or whatever. And the guy was like, here, I need some of your, like, give me some of that mojo or whatever. And he was like, that is not belief. Right. That is desperation. And did you like, notice that he totally, I like he that. totally let Crash, like he totally included a little bit later on when Crash handed him his bat. He was just like, yeah, cool, but dude, because they're both part of this world of like, of of honoring belief. honoring honoring belief right. that is a good thing and I, I feel like this whole movie did that really well yes. like whatever somebody's whatever the superstition was we'll call it superstition i guess but i think crash expresses that really well when he says in that fight if you believe you're playing well because of whatever it is right. then you are and you should know that i love that kind of like and you should know that being that whole thing of annie being in this club of people who just know that believe in things which ultimately is the religion of this film oh that's interesting yeah that's right like if the religion is baseball then the ritual is anything well and again even that's even even me who knows nothing about baseball knows that baseball players have superstitions and that you are supposed to honor them like that mm-hmm. that it's like whatever it's like is whatever is giving yeah. you that streak you honor that thing that's right period don't change your underwear i don't care right. those are your that's how you tie your lucky knot all right right <laughs> yeah exactly do it the same way every time right. Ro- no you're right rose goes in the front big boy <laughs> <laughs> um well and that's i mean i mean in the, so good. in the larger in the larger world there's something truly beautiful about that is that the i i mean there's a kind of a unitarian aspect to this where you're saying yes. belief is belief and mm-hmm. and it's powerful right and if you just are choosing belief like if you just choose belief as a way of life, if you're honest about that, then suddenly every form of that is equal and worth honoring. And you don't have to yeah. personally practice every one of them, but mm-hmm. like that they all become meaningful. Yes. Yes. And so that's kind of, I feel like that is the larger message, like that baseball is the setting but that the larger message of this is that there is something beautiful about belief and you don't need to parse that in the same way. Yeah. Like just, just accept it. Just take it as rote. You mean just honor you it. Need you to, just honor it. Period. Just honor it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that very much. Um, so I, I really think that that's an integral part of this story. 
I mean, also and also call people on their shit. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, and that's what's beautiful about that argument is because he's saying to Annie, you do know this because you are a person who knows baseball and you're trying to subvert it because you want to have sex. That's what he's saying to her yeah. is like, yep. you're, you're, it's true. you're fucking with the big truths of the, of the universe right now so that you yeah. can get laid. <laughs> How dare you, ma'am? Right, exactly. How dare you? And then you're going to quote. Well, then you're just going to say William. <laughs> you're going to quote right, William right. Blake at me. <laughs> exactly. Like that makes it better. Right. That does not make up for it. Like you are fucking with the cosmic world right now, and right. no William Blake is going to make up for that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So true. Okay, but we haven't got to the part that the like part that I find significant in this is that I mean, oh. okay, that whole conversation is amazing. The whole scene from the beginning. But what I love about it in terms of their relationship is that at the end of all of this, his ironing board gets flipped over. Oh, I missed that. That's a good detail. Right? So this is this amazing yeah. detail of just like all this stuff, like they're clashing, clashing, clashing. Yeah. And his ironing board with like this beautiful setting that we had this so, you know, insane, you know, just so intimately crash setting of this thing yeah. where before she walk before she walks in and makes a mess of it all mm -hmm. that's okay gets... he's gonna make a big mess of her kitchen counter so uh... right well there's but even <laughs> right other than the kitchen i love the kitchen counter part but the other one i love is when they're having sex th the first time i believe and you, s you cut to you know what what would normally be like that modesty cut where you're like although oh sure right, totally not trying to do that in this film but yes but no, you there's get plenty that of, cut plenty of sex. to her dresser which is also yeah. altar like like because she mm -hmm. basically has created every surface in her house as some sort of altar and yep and them having sex is shaking the dresser and everything starts toppling over yeah. all of this world that she the physical world that she's constructed for herself starts falling apart because she isn't controlling the situation like she can with with Ebby. She can't oh, she sure. isn't tying yeah. him up and making him read Walt Whitman. She doesn't get mm -hmm. like like he said in the beginning, like why do you decide? Why don't why don't I get to decide? Yeah. Like sure. To, the the deal that she struck with him to be with him is to not be in control. Right. That neither of them Really, neither of them are. Right. Neither of them are doing projects, and he doesn't do any of that kind of like the stuff you see with Ebby, right. where he's like mentoring. Right. If he slipped into some kind of mentorship role with Annie, I would be out. Right. But he doesn't do that. They both just, I love that reconciliation that they have in the rainy porch. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. It's perfect. Where they just want to be together because they like each other and turn the music on and dance. Yep. Like, exactly. Yes. Yep. Beautiful. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But they don't get there just because they're both pretty and we like them. They got there exactly. because they went yeah. through this whole process. Because he's with the each new other. guy in town and she's already dated right. everybody else. Right. And so this is obvious. Yeah, exactly. No, it's because mm -hmm. they both confronted their fears and chose each other anyway. Yeah, I like that. And because they do, they are, to use a phrase that I don't actually care for, but that's okay, like resonating on the same frequency. Yeah. Like they, they just click. No, they absolutely are. I, I really like that too. And yes, the kitchen scene, quite good. Quite good. Pretty sexy. I love it when he paints her toes. I knew you would love that. I don't know why <laughs> that is so <laughs> lovely. <laughs> but there's, I don't, I don't know what it is about that. But I, I ah, they've got the whole bathtub thing, which lots of people do the bathtub right. and the candle thing. Like, okay, you see that all the time. Um, see, I, I think, don't know what that was. Okay. I, I did not like track this and I'm not sure if there's a way to track this. I think mm -hmm. there are two things that might not have existed much before this film so i don't know if the whole candle of the bathtub oh, putting out the like candles, this might have been the first time i don't know sure. if it's the first time the, my question is is this the first time you hear the question of why in past lives are people always famous that was funny yeah which is like something that has no, just joe Schmo. right that has yeah. definitely been in other movies and other conversations but i'm like i you know i was i was i didn't see this in the theater I was 20 when I first saw it. It came out when I was, what is it, 88? So I was 19 when it came out. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever had that conversation before this movie about why aren't people famous and, I mean, why are people always famous people in past lives? And I definitely ended up in a million conversations in my adult life like that. It That's might so actually have started here. There is a chance that it started here. That, for that what question. thought I have given to past lives, which is very little, 
but I had like a sister who was really into metaphysics for a while. And so she had like a past life reading done. And of course she was like a princess from India and it's right, like, of like there's always like, there's is. something. Everyone always is. But whenever I have like had any kind of any moment of spiritual something where I'm like, maybe in a past life I was, it's for me always something like, like a farmer. <laughs> like it's something very, maybe this is why I like to garden things. I don't know. Like it's a very, it's never that is hilarious. A that's queen not of usually something. how oh, that goes. That that's sounds not usually how that goes. Horrifying. Because right? then I feel like, I'm sorry, past life. I'm really fucking this one up. I don't know what I did. <laughs> I'm in a small Oklahoma house. It's fine. <laughs> I went to college at 35. I'll get there. <laughs> well, that's interesting. You have a much more realistic view of past lives than I think most people do. <laughs> I am very curious if this movie was the origin of that of that criticism of the past life thing. I don't know. That's very funny. Yeah. I, I wonder how you can find that out. That's, that's funny. I feel like it's a very appropriate joke for this film because this film is ultimately in large part about people who are like, have mad talent versus people who just live life well. And these two mm. ultimately are kind of just choosing to live life well with each other. I think that's part of yeah. their choice. And so this, que like, the fact that she, I mean, it's so Annie to, like, think that in a past life she was something glorious because yes, she's such, because she's such, you know, she has such a great, you know, she, she lives within a bubble of the grandiose stories she tells herself yes. about herself already. Mm -hmm. And well, she already thinks that she's like the lucky charm or whatever right, it is exactly. for right. this baseball right. team. She's sure. very, she's very involved in in mythologizing herself yes uh-huh even deifying herself is that how you would say a that? little bit and i think yeah. that mm -hmm. and i think that that has i mean that's in my eyes kind of the sad side of her world it's like again it's the same thing it's like it's a it's a thing that's really beautiful because she constructs this beautiful world around herself but you kind of know that to some extent she's doing that to buffer herself from having to confront reality Mm -hmm. sure. and when she meets him she actually has to let go of that a little bit and just yeah. actually live on earth because the only way she can have a real relationship is to not set aside that completely because obviously he wants to be a part of that but to some extent you have to she has to let go of control like he says i can't right, i can't, the control I can't be like interested that. in a woman who's interested in that boy and that boy mm -hmm. because she is always interested in the boys and partly it's because she could not manipulate but she could be the one in charge of the situation she could shape it, it. Was a bit manipulative i think yeah not not you know um malevolently so malevolent is that right Mal mm. yes anyway yes that is yes. the correct word <laughs> So I said, I was like, no, that's a Disney villain. No, that's, that, Maleficent. that's Maleficent. I think I'm right. <laughs> Not unrelated. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think... Her intentions are good. I think, I don't know. I guess I like the word control better than manipulate in this situation, even though it can be done either way. Because I always think of manipulate in terms of um, controlling with an end that is good for you and not for the other person. Sure. And I think, you know, part of it is she's telling herself the story of herself also as a saint, as this person who, sure. who is selfless yeah, and helps people. Yeah, kind of a Joan people. of Arc. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. So yeah. it's like almost like she's manipulating herself as well. So that's why I like, you know, I just feel like control and mythologizing that's makes more sense. That's why I think that opening monologue is so important to Annie's character. Mm -hmm. Because without it, she becomes sad and controlling. But with and it, a caricature. she's like... And she's and not a caricature. a caricature. No, for right. sure. Yeah. And also just, oh, yeah. She just loses so much depth without mm -hmm. that opening monologue. And there's a whole lot of voiceover, which isn't always a thing that I like. But oh, I think it seeing her always walk works through that here. town. Oh, yeah. No, I completely agree. It's just lovely. I love how in that town, even, she is respected mm -hmm. and revered. Like, she's a bit of a deity in that town. Like, she is a bit of like, oh, she's going to pick you this year? You're going well, to be blessed, my son. At least in the baseball the portion God of with you. At least in, in the, the baseball, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Well, that's what I mean by right. this community, the community right. that we see, like the baseball community. Yeah, and okay, and I really want to talk about her and Millie as well. I really love her. I was going to say, I and Millie, really sure. I love her mm -hmm. relationship with Millie. It's beautiful. I love that she starts with 
with Millie saying, I was lured. And she says, we are not lured. We are strong women and we take responsibility for our Mm -hmm. actions because definitely, I mean, this was not a situation where Millie was victimized in any way. No, she was just, Millie was having a great time. It was very clear. Right. Yes. (laughs) And then like the part that I love so much is when, when she's doing the wedding dress and she's, and Millie says, do I deserve to wear white? And she says, honey, we all deserve to wear white. Mm -hmm. I love that. She is, when she's at her best, like when she's at her worst, she is uh, protecting herself from connection to other people through her mythologizing. When she is her best, she is supporting other people from a deep place of beauty in her heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I agree. She has a real priestess quality Mm -hmm. in those moments that's really lovely right and when she's using it to connect i mean i think that's the big Mm -hmm. difference is sometimes she's using it to make a connection and sometimes she's using it i feel like to ward off her fear of connections and that's the difference yeah and to protect herself Yeah. yeah right i mean we don't yeah we have not talked about ages can i just bring up that when this film came out in 1988 uh-huh. Susan Sarandon was 42. Kevin Costner. <sighs> She's such a hero. Kevin, Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner. Uh-huh. 33. Wow. Right? I love it. Also, I'm sorry about your life, Kevin. Not looking like a 33-year-old man in this film, but that's okay. That's fine. Way to go, Susan. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I don't know... Um, I don't know how much you've watched Susan Sarandon's older films. I mean, she is famous, of course, for Rocky I was Rocky obsessed Horror. with her for a little while. Rocky Horror is not for me, but I have seen it. <laughs> yeah, it's very not for you. Although, uh, I don't it's know. Maybe me. now you would appreciate it in a different way. I mean, it is No, I there. do appreciate it. I appreciate I've been to the live show in my lingerie. Like, I appreciate it. <laughs> it's just not for me. <laughs> it is how I spent much I of my it. high school. <laughs> And I would be disappointed if you didn't, <laughs> frankly, Daphne. Um, that is hilarious. Um, also, uh, I should bring up The Hunger, which you should watch. Everyone should watch. The if Hunger. You... I don't think I know that. That is her and David Bowie and Catherine Deneuve, and they are vampires Ooh. and lesbians. What? <laughs> okay, we'll watch. Into it. <laughs> You had me at lesbian vampire Susan Sarandon. <laughs> and Catherine Deneuve. I'm sorry. I mean, I and love Catherine Deneuve. I love, I love, no, also Catherine I love, Deneuve. I love, I love I'm just Susan saying, Sarandon. that was just icing on the Susan Sarandon lesbian vampire cake. <laughs> Which is probably um, something a lot I of have, people say about I Catherine have Deneuve. Not seen, I have not seen The Hunger since the early 90s, but I highly recommend even not mm-hmm. having seen it since okay. then. Okay. No, I'll look into that. Oh. No, I watched her. I think I fell in love with her. When she was in Stepmom. Okay. Nobody, Much later. I don't know if you right? saw that. Much I later. Yes, it, yes, yes. But I'm aware but of it. But then I went back. She just, she was magnificent. She was just magnificent. But then I saw uh, Safe Passage. Did you see that? Nope. That's another good. She's just done incredible work. I've clearly just seen more of her older stuff. So yeah. I was going to say, you've seen more. The older. Safe Passage was like 90s probably. See, and yeah. like the oldest movie I've seen of her is The Front Page, which was 1974. This is what I'm trying to say. Like, Whoa. Yeah, she's been acting You didn't for see really Shall We Dance time. with her and Richard Gere? They have the spaghetti and they dance. No? What okay. is that? Wow. Which one is that? Shall We Dance? It was like a remake of a Japanese film that did really well. Uh, yes, I am aware of that. It was that Richard and Gere and Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez was not good yet. Jennifer Lopez has been good in things, but this movie was not one of them. But Susan Sarandon, Richard Gere... Yeah. Yeah. It's darling. Yep. Nope. And she's wasted. I know. She's just wasted. I know her older stuff. She's so good. Um, yes. And I, I recommend a movie, which I have recommended to you before. <laughs> I also don't know if it's good or not, but uh, a few years after this one was White Palace. Yes. You have recommended that. Oh my God. We didn't even talk about Thelma and Louise. And we have not talked about Thelma and Louise. Which we have to do for this I guess we do. Podcast. Huh? We have to. We have to. Yeah, we do. It's incredible I've, and important. I've also not seen it in a very long time. When it came out, I was just finishing college, and I think I saw it four times in the theater. Good for you. <laughs> Sometimes you just like, past Daphne makes me so proud. I'm just like, this is why we're friends. 
<laughs> I missed all of that. I saw bits and pieces of it occasionally on like TNT or something oh, growing weird. up. That's so weird. Like, oh, there's Brad Pitt. He's so hot. That is so and weird. And just didn't even think twice about it. And then now that I'm like in film school, I was like, okay, no, Thelma and Louise is like a classic. I should watch this. And I was watching it to pay attention to like lighting and costume oh, that's and whatever. Hilarious. I am very did not by know that. what I was getting into. Oh my Got God. to the end, which I know everybody so knows wait, the just ending. really like, recently ending. you watched it, you're saying. Really recently, like a few months ago. Wow. And Daphne, I was sobbing. Of course you were. Like hysterical, cathartic. I I was not anticipating those levels of it's a big holy shit it's a big, emotional it's a big deal movie. catharsis. I was it's a big deal movie. Yep. And I would like to do it for this podcast. Okay. No, saying. no, we will. That's I mean okay. that would be really interesting for me to watch it again. I haven't watched it in so long. Yeah. Also it has Tommy Lee Jones and I really love that man. Are you sure? Harvey Keitel. Oh, it's Harvey Keitel? Okay, I'm confusing yep. it with the fugitive. Okay, you right. Are. Yes. Interesting. That also is... a lawman with a furrowed right. brow and a very serious right. face on right. the phone, right. but a different film. You're right. It yes. is. That's totally true. <laughs> I love a gr- I love a grouchy a grouchy but good-hearted lawman. That's, yeah. I guess that's what I love. No, me too. <laughs> me too. It's so good. Oh my god. Oh. Oh yeah, it is. Oh, oh wow. So I really good. I don't I don't think I I mean it's like I saw it I think four times in the theater and I I am not sure I've seen it since whatever year that was. It was 92, I think, it came out. Oh, I've got it right in front of me. Uh, it made me think of you a lot. We should watch it. 91. 91. Wow. Interesting. Oh, Susan Yeah, Brandon. she's had an amazing career. Um, mm-hmm. she, she is, yeah, she's incredible. Yeah. She is truly And incredible. she's a knockout. So nice yes, and also, and again, like I just really love that she was nine years older than him when this movie came out. And... Incredible and smoking hot, top of her game. Yep. Oh, also, I did. Ugh. I told you, I did find the script on online, and it does say at the beginning, Annie Savoy, mid thirties. And I was like, yes, they nice cast her older nice. than what it said in the script, and I am so pleased. Yes, I know. Score for women. Yes, awesome, yes. especially in Hollywood. Yeah. Way to go. I know. So, Good girl. Yes. All of that just gives me a lot of joy. Mm-hmm. Um, I love it. Yeah. I'm glad you shared that tidbit with me. But that took us on a ride. I'm sorry. I know. I, like, I know. We went, derailed we us went, to we Susan went, Sarandon we went town. D- down You're the welcome. Susan Sarandon road <laughs> through vampires and Thelma and <laughs> all sorts of things. Oh. Yep. Mm. So good. Rocky Horror. Rocky oh, Horror. Yeah. Oh, Janet. Oh, um, touch me. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I loved her in that. That's probably no, that's probably I get it. where I first knew her. I mean, the movie. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty positive. That's where I first knew her. Because, yeah, that came, most people did, that came out in the that's 70s. Important. I was watching it in the 80s. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just like looking at her IMDb right now. Uh, sure. Yes. Because, yeah, there was a bunch of stuff I didn't watch then. And then e- Witches of Eastwick was 87. So that was the movie before this. Wow. I have somehow not seen that one, but I've heard of it. Oh, my God. You're going to love that, too. <laughs> yeah, I think well, so. Also, that's her and Cher and Michelle that's Pfeiffer. That's what I Cher is who I think of. Michelle Pfeiffer. Okay, I'm in. The, okay, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> like, I'm in. It does, it, I mean, it, it's also a really fun movie, but it doesn't really matter because you have the three of them in one place. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yep. I mean, also Jack Nicholson, but but really, it's not about Jack Nicholson. I mean, it is. He's you know he's a, is he a wolf. No, that's something like else. A werewolf. That's, that's another else? thing with okay. him and Michelle Pfeiffer. See? Yes. Oh my god, I wow. forgot about that movie. All of a sudden, yeah. again, like my nine-year-old brain was like, "Wait a minute." Okay. I have a memory. Okay. We're like I'm way, sorry. way <laughs> tangents now. Let's let's bring it back to Bull Durham. Bringing it back to Bull Durham. <laughs> bringing it back uh so many movies that just came up that need to go on our list so let's bring it back to bull durham and i wanted to know if there's anything else you wanted to talk about or should we go to favorite things i want to really quick i just looked up my i just looked at my notes i talked about how annie would kind of set herself up as a deity sometimes Mm -hmm. but i think crash did that too when he literally played god and made a force of nature (laughs) God, and love, flooded the field I for the rain out. I love that scene so much. Excellent scene. Right? 
excellent scene. It's so yes. random, but it's yeah. so wonderful. I love how much those two characters are naturally influential and inspirational mm-hmm. in their little, again, I'll call it a community, their little baseball community. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just a beautiful thing. And I thought that was when we saw how much those two meet each other, I think, on that kind of metaphysical plane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And you yeah. do have this kind of wonderful multi-generational thing going on, like where he is the older baseball player. They are all kids. Mm-hmm. Remember, he told he told the manager, their kids scare them. Like he yeah. he's not in the same space as them. And he he, for the most part, like Annie, utilizes that in a way to teach and enhance and mm-hmm. make connection with the, I mean, again, his you know, his, his relationship with Ebby is fraught because he was brought sure. in specifically to teach him and he has a lot of envy of him. Right. And there's the competition. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, he has, you know, he has that mix of like, of envy and legitimate, you know, just like, dude, what you, you are so fucked up. Cause he is, I mean, he's just a yeah. mess. He's, he's a, a mess. mess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. He is a man child for sure. He is absolutely a man child. Um, <laughs> But he learns. I mean, that's, I mean, he's a man, but he's, he is a good person. He does learn. No, I was just thinking of that scene where he punches Crash. Right. He's like, did you hit him with your right or your left? Yep. My left. Good. You're a pitcher. Right. <laughs> well, and I love at the very end where he's saying goodbye to him and he messes up the words on purpose and Crash gets all annoyed with him. And he's just like, I just am doing this to like, I just like watching you get upset. Oh, yeah. I forget uh-huh. what it is, like fear and ignorance, fear and something or something. But he like takes, uh, I forget, he makes something into ignorance. Mm-hmm. He takes a word and makes it into ignorance. And then Crash just gets so annoyed with him. And he's just like, dude, yeah. I'm, I'm do- make it so easy. Right. I'm doing yeah. this to annoy you. You're so cute. <laughs> and I love like oh, that was just dear. a lovely little moment because it's like, you know, he, he resented Crash and he didn't want to listen to Crash. And then it gets to the point where he's annoying to Crash. He's like, teach me more, teach me more. Yes. Uh huh. And then he reaches the point where he, like, where he's just like, okay, now we're kind of equals. Like, now, mm-hmm. now I can mess with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like it. Yeah. So I, I, I do like Evie. I don't, I mean, he's, you know, he is a mess. And he's definitely a man child, but he's endearing yeah. too. Like I love in the beginning where he's dancing with all those women. Like he's not dancing with all those women because he's an asshole. He's just dancing with all these women because he's just too much. There's just too much him. He's just all over the place. <laughs> it's the equivalent. It's an interesting. It's meaning. like okay. it's like what Millie said. Like that he pitches. He fucks like he pitches like he fucks. He's just kind of all over all the over the place. Yeah, sure. He, sure. he doesn't. He's not. He doesn't have ill will. That's what I'm trying to say. Like he's, yes, I think that's fair. Right. Absolutely. Like he's not mm-hmm. a bad person. I think that's person. part of the whole man just, child right, thing. Though. Exactly. That's, that's the whole boyishness. And I, I know there are a lot of people who don't want to excuse that. And I'm not saying I want to excuse that in real people. Right. But, but for this character. Right. Sure. Because he does learn and he's not, he's not trying to be hurtful. Sure. Yeah. Or even just being self-obsessed, really. He's just. He's like a puppy dog. Oblivious? He's, yeah. Just a bit oblivious. A little bit of a puppy. Yeah. Yep. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of who he is. All right. So shall we get on to favorite things? Favorite parts. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. What's yours? You start. Well, I think we've talked about mine, but I'm going to choose one that we did like one. I have like a list of them. And so I'm going to choose mm-hmm. the one that we didn't talk about, which was the hilarious conversation at the dugout. You like you you started talking oh, about yeah. where everyone ends up everyone ends up or the mound. It's not the dugout, it's the mound. Sorry. It's on the Sorry, mound. Baseball yeah. people. Oh my god, I'm so bad. At That's the mound. Hysterical. And everyone ends yeah. up there and so so right. So like the one guy has the curse on his bat or on his glove and like yeah. and like they're all talking about about um, Millie and Millie's the guy, the, whatever, the, the fiance, fiance, the dude. Yes. Um, they can get him for a wedding present. Yes. I do love that the one guy is like, wait till I tell him and, and Crash is like, no, no one's going to talk about Millie. No one. Right. Mm-mm. So I love that. And, and I just, and I love that they're, they're just all like hanging out, dealing with their pride. They're just like, they're a family. And I really love yep. that. And I just love, and then the guy who's like, I don't know, the assistant manager comes up and he's yeah. like. And he's like, what's going on? And they're like, well, there's this problem and there's this problem. There's this problem. And he's like, well, candlesticks are always a good gift. (laughs) 
and maybe check where she's registered. <laughs> I was just like, yes. this is so weird. Like, this is the, the last is thing you would expect to be having as a conversation in the middle of a baseball game. And yet, yeah. it did not seem remotely, like, out of the realm of possibility because yeah. these people are all such fully realized we like weirdos in the sure. best way possible i believe yeah. every minute of it <laughs> yeah i like that okay that's my favorite part um my favorite part is i think the little romance montage where we get the fucking mm-hmm. on the kitchen table and the bathtub and the painting the toenails and that whole bit and the dancing just, and the dancing and the dancing in the kimono yeah that was my favorite i was like okay I believe in you two kids, and I want you to be happy together. Yep. But I loved it. And your house will be filthy, but y'all will be happy. Yep, exactly so. <laughs> yep, always dishes in the sink. Wax melted all over everything. Yes, wax all over the carpet. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Yeah, I like it too. Well, thank you again for introducing me to this movie. Oh, I'm so glad. I wouldn't have seen it without you. I'm so glad. I feel like I feel like I'm a little worried now that we're going to pick a movie from my youth. Like we've had such a streak of, of me still liking them, I'm a little scared we're going to pick one. I'll be like, oh god, how could it'll I happen. ever have liked that? Sure. Yeah, it'll happen. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I guess 20 year old me had okay taste, but I'm sure there's some movies where I'm not going to like them anymore. Sure. Um, okay, well, we have not yet decided what we're doing next. <laughs> we haven't. We will. Uh, yeah, we have a list of all sorts of fun things, and we do. I'm yeah. not sure what we're doing. But our next thing uh, for our patrons is that we are going to do a, a commentary track for Black Sales with Andrew Dice. Who <gasps> has, oh, that's right. Who has been a guest on this podcast with mm-hmm. with us for Pride and Prejudice, right? Yes, for the Pride and Prejudice films. Andrew was our guest for Pride and Prejudice. Yes. Um, and has been our guest on Fathoms Deep as well. And uh, and we will announce on Twitter when we decide what our next film is going to be for we this podcast. We will let you know. Mm-hmm. And until then, from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Ellis. Can I just say podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash commonroomradio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag CanIJustSay and follow us on Twitter at Just Say Podcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening.